Let's do this. Hey team, it's Justin Zeltzer here from zstatistics.com, your international emporium of statistics. I just made that up. Uh, today we're going to look at survival analysis, which is quite exciting. I um, personally really enjoy this topic. And as you can see, we're going to go through from the very beginning, looking at the intuition behind survival analysis. We're going to trace our way through looking at life tables, Kaplan-Meier curves, the hazard function, which is going to be quite interesting. Uh, and then also look at how it's modeled out in the real world, which is predominant, predominantly by something called the Cox proportional hazards model. And we'll do that one over two videos because there's quite a lot of content to cover there. But this is going to be great. Please join us. If you like, uh, you can check out my website, zstatistics.com. It's got all the videos up there from this series and my other series on statistics. Uh, so yeah, let's get stuck straight in, shall we? So in this first video, we'll be checking out the intuition behind survival analysis. We'll also be exploring how we measure survival time. We'll look at visualizations of survival rates and also discuss the varying applications that survival analysis has across many fields. So what is survival analysis? Well, it's also known as time to event analysis. So clearly we are concerned with the time that an event takes to occur after something called an exposure. Now, as an example, an exposure might be something like a diagnosis. So say the diagnosis of hepatitis. And the event we might be interested in could be death or it could also be something like cirrhosis of the liver. Cirrhosis being a common outcome after one has been diagnosed with hepatitis. So in that example, the diagnosis of hepatitis is where our clock starts to try to assess this time to event. And then the event, the progression into cirrhosis of the liver, that would be where the clock stops. And it's the time in between those two points, which is of interest, which is called the survival time. Now you'll notice in my example, the event wasn't death, but it often can be when we're using survival analysis. And a very typical example might be looking at cancer or the diagnosis of particular forms of cancer as our exposure, and then assessing how long it takes someone to die from cancer. Or put more positively, how long they typically survive from diagnosis. Now we can also do interesting things like look at uh, divorce rates. So marriage might be the exposure of interest, which is a funny way of looking at marriage. And then uh, the event would be divorce and we could assess the survival time of the marriage. So it doesn't really matter if we're talking about health or we're talking about some kind of social institution or the survival, say, of a company after a particular stock market shock, something like that. At any event, survival time is of particular interest when we're looking at survival analysis. You might be thinking now, well, can't we apply survival analysis to, say, the coronavirus? Because that's been all over the news, obviously. Uh, well, not really is my answer to you, because with the coronavirus, we're not really interested in the time it takes someone to uh, die or recover from the initial infection. That time period is not really of interest to us. We just care if they die or not. So in that sense, it's not really worth doing a survival analysis on coronavirus data. So rather we use survival analysis uh, on things that have a bit more of a delayed onset of symptoms and where we care about that time frame. So something like cancer where we can say, well, you've got diagnosed cancer on this particular date and we're keen on knowing how long you survive for after that date. Um, maybe dementia is another thing as well that we might look at or a hip fracture or something like that where we are dead set keen on knowing how long it takes for the event to occur, which in most cases will be death. Okay, so let's have a look at how we might measure survival time. So in this example, we're going to be using lung cancer as our exposure and assessing the survival time from a diagnosis of lung cancer. So let's say we're conducting this study over the course of, say, 10 years. 
So what we're going to need to do is collect some data from people that have been diagnosed with lung cancer and see when they have died over the course of those 10 years. So let's just say our first person in our sample was diagnosed in 2021 and then survived for another four years. Our second person in the sample was diagnosed in 2022 and survived six years. So you get the gist. Let's say we have a few more people in our sample. Now, as you can see, they each have a different starting time from when their diagnosis of lung cancer actually occurred. So while indeed on this axis here, we have time in years, in calendar years, if you like, what we're going to need to do to conduct a survival analysis is reset each of these particular survival times so that they start at the same point. So if we shift them all backwards like this, the axis down here now becomes time since diagnosis. And now we have something we can analyze for survival. So in this case, if we draw a vertical line down at say three years, we can see that the survival rate after three years is 80%, as four out of the five people in our sample are still surviving, given that their lifelines continue through three years. After five years, however, it's down to 40%, as only two of our five people sampled are still alive. So this is essentially what's happening behind every survival analysis that gets conducted. Now you might be asking, what actually happens to the people that don't die by the end of the study period? Because at some point, we have to write up our analysis, right? And at that point, many people in the sample might not yet have died. Well, this is an issue called censoring, and we'll look at that in our next video. So hold that thought, and you can join me in the next one to learn all about it. But we're keeping things simple for this first introductory video. So let's keep these numbers in mind. We have an 80% survival after three years and a 40% survival after five years. So let's try and visualize these survival rates now. So you can see on this y-axis, we have the survival rate from 0% to 100%. Now, because the numbers are quite nice, we've got five people in our sample. Each time somebody dies, the survival rate's gonna dip down 20% or one fifth. So if we map out the survival rate across time from the example we just saw, you can see we get this sort of a step ladder type thing where as soon as someone dies, the survival rate dips down 20%. And if we look up the time of three years, we can see that the survival rate indeed is 80%. And at five years, the survival rate is 40%. Now this step ladder looking graph that you're seeing here is actually called a Kaplan-Meier curve. And again, we'll have a look at this in more depth in a subsequent video. Now, if it doesn't look too much like a curve to you, that's because we've only got five people in our sample. But imagine if we had a thousand people in our sample, those steps will be infinitesimally small. And so it will look like more of a curve. So as you can see, this is a, a nice way to visualize how quickly people die from lung cancer once they are diagnosed with it. And it's a good word I'm going to use here, which is to say that this is a non-parametric curve. And when I say non-parametric, I mean that there is no parameters involved. It's simply derived from our data set. So it looks very custom made just for the data set that we received. Parameters can be used when we start doing some more advanced analysis and things like modeling, where we might use something called a hazard parameter. But again, I don't want to blow your head off too soon here. So we'll leave it at that for the moment. But to finish off this video, I just want to look at now some applications of survival analysis. And as you can see, I've got uh, several different fields in which we can apply survival analysis. Obviously in health, as we've already seen, we're looking at the time to death or time to say device failure. So the exposure of interest might be the insertion of a pacemaker into someone's chest. And you want to know how long that pacemaker survives inside someone's chest. That's a crucial piece of information. We can also have time to readmission after someone is discharged from hospital. There's a lot of 
scientific papers out there using survival analysis assessing time to readmission. Now, in manufacturing, you can appreciate that we could probably use survival analysis to assess the component failure in particular machines. And we can also be interested in the time it takes for a device to become obsolescent or for patents to be approved. And I haven't just selected these off the top of my head. There are actual scientific papers that use survival analysis to assess these particular things. In finance, we can look at the time it takes for businesses to fail, the time it takes staff to turn over, or the time it takes someone to get a promotion after starting at a business. In that way, the word survival is probably misused there, but the analysis that we're conducting is still very much appropriate. So I guess that shows that goes to show that the event doesn't always have to be death or something bad. The event could actually be something good and we could be assessing the time it takes for that good thing to happen. So there's our time to divorce again, if we're looking at uh, sort of social contexts. You can also find the time it takes a couple to have their second child after their first. And there's actually quite a few papers that use survival analysis looking at sport. And I'll put a link to some of these in the description. There's one that looks at the time it takes soccer players to be substituted from the field. We might use this analysis to figure out, well, when is the optimum time to make your substitution? So that's it, guys. Thanks for watching the first video in this series on survival analysis. They're all going to be up on zstatistics.com. Leave a like, subscribe, do all those kind of things. That'll help me out a bunch. And I'll catch you in the next video where we're going to look at the concept of censoring. Crucial concept for survival analysis. So see you there.